Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. <clears throat> On the 150th birth anniversary of Mohandas Karamchand Gandhi, the Mahatma Gandhi, we are gathered here today to commemorate interesting facets of his iconic, effervescent life of a philosopher, political activist, and most of all, his colossal persona as a prophet of nonviolence in the freedom struggle of India. Personally, I believe, Mr. Speaker, of his multi-spirited and multidimensional activism, every aspect remains relevant to the current world of politics. Of these, what holds most immediate currency for the politics of the day is his unswerving potential of nonviolent struggle for democratic self-rule and the constitutional process that he supported. The Indian constitution, needless to say, remains a historical document relevant globally, even at this day and age when thoughts are evolving on systems that look beyond nation states. Mr. Speaker, we all know that Mahatma Gandhi wasn't directly involved in the making of the Indian Constitution. But all his ideas were sufficiently reflected in the two plans that he submitted in 1946 and in 1948. Incidentally, on the day of his assassination, that was in 1948. A follower an enthusiast of Gandhi, Sriman Narayan Agarwal, drafted the volume, Gandhian Constitution for Free India. Mahatma Gandhi made a comment about it in a foreword of this volume, published in 1946, where he says, says that the Constitution, based on his writing, is not inconsistent with what I would like to stand for. This draft was based on the principle that violence leads to centralization. The essence of nonviolence for him meant decentralization and devolution for the periphery. In Mahatma Gandhi's draft constitution, the primary political unit would be the village panchayat, where the panchayat members would be elected by the village elders. Obviously, this was fraught with disapprovals and contestations at that time. However, these thoughts remain valid to date and demand serious consideration and deliberation even in Sri Lanka. Mr. Speaker, his own thoughts of nonviolence kept evolving to a point that in his latter days he stopped using the word nonviolence. He says, my vocabulary on the subject was still in the process of formation. This was because of his thoughtfulness towards the minority languages and his sensitivities towards the understanding of this concept, especially when he had to address the Muslims of the North who were embroiled in the Khilafat movement against the British. He also had to appease to them then to the Hindus in Gujarat, the people of Punjab, the Sikhs, then a mixed audience in Calcutta, etc. He adopted the term non-cooperation instead of non-violence for want of a better word in vernacular translations, to appease to all sentimentalities, to mobilize them to unite for a single cause, to take the Swadeshi wow to boycott foreign goods. He praised the Muslims in his autobiography. I quote, the Muslims have adopted a very important resolution. If the peace terms are unfavorable to them, which may, which may God forbid, they will stop all cooperation with the government. It is an inalienable right of the people, thus to withhold cooperation. We are not bound to retain government titles and honors 
or to continue in government service if the government should betray us in a great cause like the Khilafat, we could not do otherwise than to co than non-cooperate. We are therefore entitled to non-cooperate with the government in case of a betrayal, end of quote. This is just an example that evident of his all, all encompassing power and belief in inclusivity in how he included the Muslims of the North to adapt to his cause. Needless to say, that is struggle for inclusivity against communal and religious discrimination, women's empowerment against marginalization of impoverished groups, rights of farmers and the trading communities, and also the Indian merchants' rights, their own internal struggles in a continuum are all mind-blowing. That in itself was an achievement that he rejoiced. The Mahatma, as you could see, had many internal victories to celebrate before he could ultimately win independence. He transformed Indian nationalism that evolved to inextricably intertwine integrities of equality, liberty, solidarity, sense, inconsequential politics, and inclusive nationalism. That bulwark is gone, but the Mahatma's heroism lives on. Mr. Speaker, as President Obama proclaimed recently, his heroism is not something just for India, but for the world. I quote, in the words of former President Obama, in the life of Gandhiji and his simple and profound lesson to be the change we seek in the world, and just as he summoned Indians to seek their destiny, he influenced champions of equality in my own country, United States of America, including a young Martin Luther King. Close quote. Mr. Speaker, we are indeed very pleased to uh, be involved in uh, this particular debate to pay tribute to one of the greatest sons ever to set foot in this world, and we pay him homage through this debate. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable.